wheel. There we go. We're on. Very lovely to meet you, Audrey. Um, I feel uh, honoured to have some of your time. Uh, so, uh, so thank you for making it. Um, so, I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't really, I sort of want to want to hear everything direct. But I've, I've, as you hopefully have gathered, I've, I've, I've been, I've read and listened to an awful lot of what you've been saying and, and what you've done. Um, just and and I and I, I'm pretty sure you will have have read the emails and know the context. But this this idea that I'm working with this, the, particularly this notion of a kind of what, what we're calling the citizen revelation now, the idea of seeing people as uh, as humans who kind of 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 nature kind of want to participate and contribute and be part of making things better, rather than as kind of selfish self self interested who who just want, want whatever they can get. I think as that as the sort of critical psychological shift in order to open up the sorts of things that you've been able to achieve is is that's really what I'm what I'm working with and and the the, the purpose of the of the book I'm writing is to try and sort of encourage people to see see that world around them, um, and so for me like the the while I I know a lot and, and like I say I'd love to go over it again and get into some of the details of it in, in a lot of ways but I know a lot of what's going on at the moment. What I'm really interested in is sort of going back to like how this came about, because as I understand it and as I sort of um, tell it at the moment, in about sort of 2012, you were you were broadly Taiwan was roughly sort of where a lot of places are right now, kind of in a kind of creeping oppression, and and it was only 2014 when and and the and the sunflower revolution that actually that changed. Um, and, and obviously 2012 when you start when Gov Zero came together and so forth. But but I'd particularly like to kind of like I say zoom in first in on a couple of moments. And the first one is that sunflower revolution time. And and one the final chapter of the book is going to at the moment is is titled that how to be an anti-hero. And it's really the idea that that, that, that that what we need in this moment is for leaders to kind of step back rather than step forward. Um, and I'm very interested in from what I've read. And it's quite hard to find a lot of stuff in English. But uh, what I've read about Speaker about Speaker Wang in that moment, and 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 I know he was he's a Kuomintang politician, and so on, so on. So yeah, maybe I'd like like is my is my portrayal of that as and his role in particular, and what was going on, a, a, an accurate one, and and what was that moment like? I guess does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, the head of parliament, Wang Jinping, uh, is an interesting character. Uh, his favorite book is the same as my favorite book, uh, which is Tao Te Ching, the, the Taoist um, um, scripture, uh, the, the classic. Uh, and uh, even though that he ostensibly is in the same political party as the president, uh, Ma ying at that point in time, uh, he isn't quite um, agreeing uh, with the president on uh, a lot of things, and in particular about how to uh, frame this Occupy of the Parliament uh, MP. Uh, all the different MPs have their own different takes, but uh, Wang Jinping uh, staunchly refused uh, to call in the police, and because the Parliament is uh, kind of it's uh, on its own, uh, if it if they call police, police come, but if they don't call police and say that what's going on is essentially a citizen's assembly, then the police can't really enter either if the head of parliament keeps saying that. Um, and so I think this is uh, really important because you then see this participatory democracy as a essentially augmentation uh, on what's going on, usually in the parliament, which is representative democracy. Uh, and he built this as a kind of citizen's democracy uh, kind of thing, and which not only gave it legitimacy but it's also uh, of a kind of Pygmalion effect, right? If you treat protesters as mobs, they then they they riot. Uh, but if they mm. tr if you treat protesters as demonstrators that are here to demo a new kind of demo democracy, they rise up to the challenge. Uh, so it's not only, uh, of course, MP wants uh, credit, but also uh, a lot more MPs at the time. But I think it's fair to call uh, the uh, MPs that at the time uh, kind of told the president to um, stay uh, the the police uh, as being one of the instrumental enabling condition for the very peaceful three weeks of Occupy. So, so lots of the other lots of the members of parliament joined those calls. That mm -hmm. joined yes, the, yes, the, the yes, 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 yes. 
Yeah, specifically when when I personally went into the occupied parliament, bringing with me this very long Ethernet cable line, uh, and uh, I was uh, escorted, as with other uh, key GovZero uh, people, uh, by um, MPs of the DPP, uh, who essentially told the police that we are their guests who are there to visit uh, the occupied parliament and so on. And so this gives this entire movement more legitimacy uh, in the eyes of not just police but also to everyday people as well. And, so, and they were MPs from both the, both the sort of major parties, all the, all the major parties, or was it, it was DPP MPs that were more with, with the Speaker at that point? There's DPP, uh, there's Tai, tai Lian, uh, I think, um, and uh, I'm not sure of any non Wang Jinping KMT uh, MPs that are like yeah. overtly uh, pro uh, occupiers, but some of them uh, at, at least uh, said that it, it's, it's not a riot or, or it's not a it's yeah. not a mob. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's mostly DPP and also the Taiwan Solidarity Union uh, yeah. and also the um, like the public referendum alliance, uh, like uh, very senior people uh, who have already been protesting around the parliament for quite some time, even before the Occupy Begin, uh, also lent uh, to the like, this idea of deliberation on the street because um, the main action actually took around the Occupy the Parliament, not within the parliament itself, which yeah. is has a rather limited capacity, certainly not half a million people, yeah. And when, and so you said, because um, I knew you'd been there sort of the day before the occupation started, but you, you actually, you went in during the occupation. I haven't realized. Yeah, that's that. right. That's right. And, and I tweeted uh, about it, actually. So if you scroll back to uh, 2014 uh, March, I uh, have this uh, Twitter thread that just goes on a kind of play by play of uh, what kind of uh, network connections were helping the occupiers setting up. And you were, and and so you you were live tweeting what the conversations were and what what they were what they were debating and discussing at that time. Mm, a, a little bit, but uh, mostly just around this uh, job of setting up a reliable internet right. connection. Uh, after which I can be safe from a distance and still follow what's going on. Right, and 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 they were, and what did they need that internet internet connection for? To to be to be broadcasting. Right, to, 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 Right to make sure that the uh, the the truth spreads faster than rumors. Uh, to make sure that people who are on the street uh, can just watch uh, the live stream feed of the occupied uh, parliament, and also making sure that the people who are like uh, stenographers uh, within the occupied parliament can just type on an IRC channel and get this kind of play by play uh, captioning uh, going on in the screens that we mounted uh, near the occupied parliament, so that people can just walk by and see what's really going on. It, it's been documented uh, by this um, GitHub page that I just pasted you. Oh, great. Thank you for that. And, and just so I'm very quickly, just so I'm clear, so what was going on in that moment, people, they were actually, it wasn't just a sit-in, like occupying, they were, they were discussing and debating how the country yes. was And both within the parliament and also by around 20 NGOs, uh, each deliberating one specific aspect of CSSDA. So the NGO that care about labor conditions will deliberate that part, about human rights, that part. There's also one side of the parliament that I remember very uh, clearly debating whether there are private sector uh, companies in the PRC, that's People's Republic of China regime, uh, for our then new, still planning 4G uh, connection uh, infrastructure. So essentially what everybody is now having a debate right now around 5G, we had that six years ago around the occupied parliament. And the consensus was that the Chinese Communist Party can swap leadership in any private sector positions anytime. So amortized, it will cost us more to do a systemic risk analysis. And anytime we do, uh, do a up upgrade uh, as compared to working with Nokia or Ericsson. And so the consensus on the street uh, reached to the head of parliament and the National Communication Commission. So we have been doing our entire 4G deployment since six years ago with no PRC components, thanks to one of the deliberations on the street. Wow. And and so th so this was really the moment when people started to could could actually see a different kind of democracy going on, like yes, from, from yes. nowhere, kind mm -hmm. of. Thing. Right, right. So, so as you just mentioned about citizens, it's when they feel that democracy is really this day-to-day -day thing, not just about uploading three bits of information per person yeah. for yes, uh, or uh, about you know being treated as users of the public service because you know users. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there's some other industries 
just one other industry that also refer to their customers right, as users. Right. Uh, and so um, it's about a kind of addictive uh, relationship and not at all empowering at all. Uh, but I think it's when people will say that, oh, they, they woke up and, and instead of being just users of the public service, they become the co-creator of public policy. Lovely, lovely. Okay, that's fascinating. And so what, what, what was the pathway? Because my understanding previously had been that after that moment, uh, mm -hmm. Everything sort of quietened down, and and mm -hmm. and we were kind of tracking along. And then the presidential presidential election came in 2016, and and then you were invited mm -hmm. into 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 mm -hmm. the administration. Is that right, or what was that? There was a mayoral election uh, at the end of 2014. That's far more defining uh, than okay. anything. So the year uh, was 2014, and the election was around the turn of the year, around the end of the year, and all the mayoral candidates that supported the Occupy gets elected, sometimes surprising to even themselves without preparing a Russian speech, uh, and all the mayoral candidates, regardless of the party, that didn't, well, didn't. So <laughs> the, the political mandate become very clear. Uh, the uh, mayor of Tainan City, uh, William Lai, uh, campaigned on his second term on open government platform, gets uh, elected now as our vice president uh, at this very moment. Uh, the mayor of Taipei, Ko wen um, like nonpartisan, also uh, campaigned on open government uh, as a platform and surprisingly uh, had a upset win and now in his second term. Uh, and so uh, it really gave uh, us a kind of new um, breed, if you will, of politicians that are basically saying we need to take whatever people did in the Occupy and make it every day in our administration, no matter how long it takes or how costly it becomes, whether it takes citizens' initiative or sandboxes or participatory budgeting or I voting, we'll make it work. Uh, and that's their uh, campaign promises. And afterwards, even the central government see that really there really is no way to go against this tide of participatory democracy. Democracy. And so they hired people who participated in the Occupied as young reverse mentors uh, to the cabinet. And I was one of the reverse mentors that was then uh, hired uh, as a kind of consultant uh, to the e making project um, managed by Jacqueline Tsai, a minister with a portfolio uh, in the same office. Actually, it's the same office that I work now. So I'm kind of an intern promoted full time. Uh, and that took place around the uh, December uh, 2014. And that and that was when so these you you went in as reverse mentors to to the KMT leadership or or that or, or this was well it's interesting right because uh, neither the uh, like Jacqueline Tsai uh, who used to be uh, director of law uh, IBM Asia uh, or Simon Zhang then uh, vice premier uh, and then eventually premier. Uh, uh, previously director of engineering Google, um, spoke the language of like traditional KMT. Uh, I don't think Simon Zhang is even a KMT party member. Uh, and so uh, they are remarkably nonpartisan. And well, if you don't like them, you call them technocratic. Uh, but if you like them, you call, you call them nonpartisan. Um, it, it's really a same thing. So um, they, they are uh, remarkably uh, um, trusting of the young reverse mentors, me included, uh, yeah. to figure out a way that goes beyond the traditional party politics. And so, of course, people who did work with them uh, risk being labeled as KMT. And many people did not work with them. Uh, but for us who worked with them, were not asked uh, in any given time to endorse anything uh, alongside the party line of the KMT because they themselves were not KMT members anyway. And, and so just so I'm really clear, uh, they were, these were the, the elected leadership, the people who had been in... Uh, no, right, right. So, so yeah, that's, sorry, but, but sorry for interrupt, but this is important because uh, us, the, the ministers in the cabinet, are twice removed from election. We're double appointees. People elect the president directly, who appoints the premier, who appoints us. Right. Uh, and so there's, uh, unlike in parliamentary uh, systems where each of us would have a constituency, uh, yep. we don't have a specific constituency. My constituency is, I guess, homo sapiens. Uh, and so the idea is that uh, the uh, people in the, especially a horizontal minister, the nine ministers with some portfolio, um, I think a vast majority of us are nonpartisans. Uh, 
uh, and there's continuity. Like uh, John Deng, the Minister of Portfolio in charge of trade negotiation, was uh, Ma ying uh Minister of Economy Affairs. Uh, and so, right. uh, and, and we're nonpartisans. And so we yeah. plan on, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years uh, term with the expectation that some of us may actually serve 10 years or more, regardless of the party leadership uh, that wins the presidential election. Um, so that's very different from parliamentary systems. So in a, in a way, you're more analogous to a to a to a sort of um, a head of a civil service department in our in our world. In, in my mm -hmm. in, in, yeah, yeah def definitely in the horizontal leadership part, yeah. and in even in the min vertical ministries, I think still uh, there are more nonpartisan ministers at this moment than members of any party. So it speaks something about the kind of nonpartisanship within the administration. But of course, once we send any draft bills to the legislature, that's purely party politics there. That's where the party politics comes in, right? Mm -hmm. And was that, and that was, uh, um, was there a, has that, has that changed from, from before 2014? So, so is it less, is it, have you, has that sort of become depoliticized or was that, has that always been the case? Well, um, that's an interesting question because uh, how long did this always go? We only get our presidential election in 1996. Of course. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, and so uh, I would say that this configuration becomes somewhat stable uh, around uh, the last batch of constitutional uh, amendments, uh, which uh, did away with uh, Citizens' uh, Assembly uh, and installed this uh, kind of semi presidential um, configuration. I don't really think it's presidential or parliamentary. It's something like a Taiwan model. Uh, and so uh, it was, I think, ratified uh, into existence in 2005. So we have this system for just 15 years. Okay, great. And so I guess, so it, that sounds to me like um, the, 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 the real moment of, of shift for you was 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 beginning of 2015 rather than rather than rather than the moment you became a digital minister really the, yes. the, big, the bigger cognitive shift was going from gov zero to, to being a reverse mentor and so what what was what happened then like how, how was that conversation where was where who 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 made the invitation what, like what what how did that happen? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, the room where it happened uh, was when uh, Jacqueline Tsai attended the Gov Zero Hackathon uh, as a minister uh, and uh, pitching, just like any uh, other uh, participant that pitches, about a e-rulemaking platform that will solve the representation problem because, uh, according to Jacqueline, uh, she wants to build a system to solve teleworking but uh, we don't have a teleworkers union at the time. Well, n not now. Uh, and we, uh, she wanted to ask, why do entrepreneurs register their company at Cayman Islands, but not in Taiwan? Uh, again, we don't have an association of entrepreneurs that register at Cayman Islands. Uh, and so um, none of these, uh, and eventually about Uber and Airbnb and so on. Yeah. So the, the common thing about these emerging retail and issues is that there's no clear representational system that can work with the traditional focus group conversations. Uh, instead, uh, each person just represents their uh, own experience working with the gig economy, platform economy, or whatever, uh, and none of the teleworker can speak for another teleworker. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it requires not just listening, but listening at scale. And, and that's what the um, hackathon pitch uh, was about. Um, and so the v project was born and a lot of people worked on it. Uh, we successfully solved quite a few issues uh, and Jacqueline uh, made sure that all the ministries bring at least one issue uh, to v one for deliberation and we prototype a lot of kind of online to offline uh, work uh, and um, in a nutshell I think uh, the public service especially the more senior leadership uh, level uh, saw us as reverse mentors that demonstrates as in uh, making demo of things not as in protesting not as taking anything down but rather pioneering a new way for the government to trust the citizens more. I wouldn't say all of them are on board, but at least they didn't try to delegitimize us. Uh, um, I think around the turn of that year, uh, in December alone, um, maybe early January, I uh, personally taught uh, not only the 300 people rank 12 or higher, that's the most senior career public servant uh, leadership, but also eventually more than 1,000 
public servants in all the different levels uh, in the um, HR in the in the training uh, classes. Uh, and so, aside from the uh, foreign service, which isn't part of that training program, and I had no idea uh, that existed until I actually become digital minister. Uh, the <laughs> other ministries uh, have a really good working relationship on at least one pilot case uh, with the reverse mentors at the time. And just, sorry again, just so I get this right. So th this was so. And, and and I've just typed the name as I is it Jacqueline Sai? That's right. That's yeah, that's right. So uh, yeah, so it was a different spelling, but okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, cool. Thank you. And then and and that was so. And did you say sh she came to the ha to the Gov Zero Hackathon? That's right. With the idea to create a, mm -hmm. a rule making. Her, her, she came with that idea. Yeah, that's and, right. And then and and that was when you, you guys put that together with Polis and mm -hmm. and the. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, we, we initially started with just this course, uh, which is another foreign software. Uh, but when the Uber case came, and it's very evident that even the three ministries, the Ministry of Economy, Transportation, uh, and Finance have very different views, uh, we're going to be swamped if we use traditional foreign moderation software. And then we just introduced Polis. And Polis has been a, a mainstay of rulemaking ever since then. And that was that was during the year of 2015. So which right, when right. the Gov Zero Hackathon was mm -hmm. in 20, early 2015. I can look. Uh, this up. Yeah, sure. You, you, you can look this up. Uh, but um, yeah. we can also do a kind of who he is uh, and just look at the. So uh, yeah, the it's right. So vtaiwan.tw was registered on 2014 December. So it's it's that date. Wow. Okay. So all this happened, and and for you personally, like, what was that? What was the that moment like? Like when when you found out Jacqueline was coming? Like like what? Yeah. What were the moments where you where you felt like that we're right? We're in, or was it? Or was it all back to that to that occupy? Like, what, yeah. That 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 was the whole point of that occupy. It's not like we want to occupy the parliament every time there's a controversial issue, right? Uh, it, it's that we really want to prototype uh, what's it like to listen at scale uh, with half a million people on the street, many more online. How can we get something like a rough consensus going? Uh, and uh, I think uh, I feel this sense of uh, like anxiety, like fear, uncertainty and doubt from the Korea Public Service because they were very much afraid that whatever uh, hard work they, they did can be just nullified by random people spilling this information, according to them, uh, on social media. And uh, it may just, uh, um, just reduce their work uh, uh, trivialize it uh, and cancel uh, their work uh, if they do not have a way to communicate not just the what of the policies made but the why of the context of policy making uh, with the citizens. So there's a lot of FUD uh, about this kind of direct democracy or participatory democracy. Many people fear that it will devolve into populism. Uh, and so that's the sense that I get from the Korea Public Service. Uh, and Jacqueline, uh, to her credit, uh, didn't um, think that we can solve this once for all, but she thought that it, it may work if we just try some really like emergent, like on everybody's kind of mind, crowdfunding and things like that. Well, why don't we just figure this out together? Because it's not like we can consult the teleworkers union. It, it's not like there's kind of magically a crowdfunding law template that we can copy. It's not like there's a, a fintech sandbox. At that time, the UK doesn't even have a fintech sandbox. Uh, and so um, nobody knows what's the right answer anyway. So why don't we just give it a try? And so I think it's this experimental, like fail fast and publicly uh, and, and then ask the people who complain to to join the task force and, and make it better. Uh, open innovation attitude that really attracted me uh, to the work. And, and did you know Jacqueline before that at all? Not at all, not at all, yeah. And, and, and I guess like, so I think I, I think in what you've just said, I know the answer, but you, you're, I mean, were you, were you worried at all? Because it sounded like in a sense you were, you were sort of stepping, she was kind of, you were going, you didn't know the answers either, right? So you didn't know how this was going to work. But well, uh, there, there's a there's a couple of things. Um, I think one of the, the the point is that Jacqueline herself joined uh, the cabinet only around the end of 2013. 
So she's not even one year in uh, when the Occupy started. She's just four months in. Uh, and so um, it, it's not like she has a lot of inertia uh, going on. So she is happy trying out whatever because she's rather new to the job too. Uh, and so that's, uh, I think, what gives this kind of solidarity across mm -hmm. generations uh, between Jacqueline and the Zero team. And the other thing is that uh, we have had some experience of participatory rulemaking working with people who cannot represent each other. It's called internet governance. We've been doing this, uh, and I've been personally doing this since I was 15 years old, uh, since 1996. And when I participated first in the Perl community and then IETF, uh, W3C or, or whatever, and that's how the internet has always worked. So it's, it's not that we don't know the right process uh, to go through this process of rough consensus, of discovery, and defining common interests and so on. It's more about writing an adapter between the um, code of algorithm to the code of text and law, which are two very different normativities. And we bring the, the um, digital native uh, know-how of how to make this kind of rough consensus work. Just look at how Wikipedia works, for example. Uh, but then we also need to make sure the career public service understand this in their terms and that they can operate it on their own without uh, each of them having to go through this full uh, you know, cyber culture, sci-fi, cyberpunk. Uh, yeah, yeah. Training, right. So, so that's the main point. Yeah. Yeah. Live long and prosper. Yeah. It's, Live long and prosper. Yes. <laughs> but they, that's yes, uh, uh, yes. go on. So that yes. that moment. Um, uh, so, sorry. Yeah. Just going into that thing. So when you were you were fifteen and you started doing this work on internet governance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that was. So I understand. Yeah. And. And this was so. This was when. So I, I've read that you 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 sort of dropped out of school. But yeah, you, yeah, yeah, that's right. Were yeah. self taught. Um, mm -hmm. Can I can I go to this thing? I mean, please tell me if you'd rather not. And, and I'm like I said, no, it's, fine. Room, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. But like that, your your trans identity and kind of and and and. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm tempted to project again, like the story that's probably that might well be wrong is like as a as a as a mm -hmm. as a young person growing up like feeling mm -hmm. uncomfortable feeling like mm -hmm. out, a little out of mm -hmm. not quite accepted and and mm -hmm. the risk would be that you would sort of live online and kind of mm -hmm. and, and detach from society but it seems like mm -hmm. you kind of engaged in society through through the internet and, and so i'm just mm -hmm. I'm like could you I, I like i'm stumbling around sort of what what is the story of that how, how do you think mm -hmm. that your identity has played a part mm -hmm. in what you've done mm -hmm. if so in what way mm -hmm. well on, on the internet really nobody care about your gender right uh, the the free software community in particular doesn't care about my gender uh and and i think uh it's really important for me to feel safe in the kind of self-expression, self working with uh, people who identify as non-binary, um, uh, who uh, were most of my uh, co-founders uh, when I uh, worked on my first startup in 1995. Um, most of them are very um, non-binary or at least very sympathetic of non-binary issues and so on. So um, it helps to, to set a, a safe space and a norm around which that this kind of um, exploration and expression um, can be uh, real. And also, I um, realized that it's not like Taiwan is particularly um, monocultural patriarchy or whatever. Uh, I need to move only slightly, just an hour's ride or something, to go into the matriarchic community of the Amis indigenous uh, nation or the Paiwan nation that doesn't care about gender when selecting their leaders or the Atayal uh, nation, which has a very different uh, relationship with the nature uh, and uh, the Bunong nation who treats the Sabiya, the, the top mountain of Taiwan as a long-lived spirit and we're just stewards to them. So, so I don't have to step far uh, to go beyond this uh, westernized 
um, kind of gender stereotype, um, GDP, linear growth, uh, industrialized transition, wh whatever that dominates the western part of Taiwan, uh, the eastern part of Taiwan uh, is far more um, diverse and inclusive. And actually, before I decided to drop out, I did spend um, quite a few weeks uh, in the Atayal uh, Mountains with the indigenous nations people. And that really helped me to, to go beyond this linear progression of individual careers, the very westernized ideas. Yeah. This is when you were like 14, 15 years old. That's right. Were... That's right, yes. Wow. I had no idea that there were there were these sort of indigenous indigenous mm -hmm. cultures kind of still thriving in Taiwan. Yeah, they are. They are we they are they're now all national languages. So we passed the National Languages Act and Taiwan now has more than 20 national languages, most of which are indigenous. More than 20 national I had no idea. The yeah. ignorance, like I just have this image of Taiwan as like high tech nation, as as basically a kind of an extended suburb of Taipei. In my yeah, that, that's the that's the western part, Taipei, Xinjiang, yeah, yeah. and that's that's the right image, but not the eastern part. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and and so you went. That's fascinating. I'm I, I'm trying to, and and do you still? So are those are those people kind of part of the project you're now? Running mm -hmm. somewhere? Yes, like yes, definitely. Uh, when I was uh, participating in Gov Zero early 2013, the, the really the one major project I went on is the MoEdict, uh, the Ministry of Education uh, Dictionary uh, project, which is a crowdsourced um, dictionary. Uh, and not only uh, working with the Taiwanese Mandarin, Taiwanese Holo, and Taiwanese Saka, which are the three ethnic Han uh, main languages, uh, but also uh, with, say, Amis, which is the matriarchy. Uh, that I just referred to, uh, and there's many um, people who are very much into, uh, for example, just using their uh, indigenous names uh, instead of uh, kanji ifai, uh, their name, uh, are uh, currently our president's office spokesperson, Gula Siudaka, uh, when she was MP, she was uh, the one of the main leaders on this movement. She used to be spokesperson uh, of the uh, administration, so I worked with her uh, a lot, and she's Amis. Uh, I think uh, even our president is 1 16th um, Paiwan or 1 8th. Uh, anyway, the, the idea is that uh, each of us uh, all have a very transcultural um, heritage and this transcultural heritage really informs the open government work and so the work on sustainability because uh, for us, the negotiation with the indigenous nations is more diplomatic, it's more multi-stakeholder, it's less about this federal municipal um, imagination is more about this uh, first nation, uh, second, third uh, nation uh, negotiations. And, and that gives a very different picture as, as opposed to, you know, Taipei and its peripherals uh, image yeah. that you just conjured up. Yeah. The, the radical imagination is so much more open if you have that. Mm -hmm. So I've just checked, is it Amis, the, the, the spelling I've just put, is that yeah. right? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yes. Cool. I'm going to look more into the, I, I have no idea, like, the, I've been looking at, um, the idea one of the one of the things i'm talking about in the book is a, is a, is sort of re, retelling and revisiting the the history of the history of humanity as a kind of a homo civis the, the sort of the citizen, mm -hmm. citizen the man of citizen like participant kind of and and matriarchy is a is a main like understanding the matriarchal cultures and and how they how they operate is a major part of that that um mm -hmm. the idea that actually it was at the at the sort of birth of the birth of mm -hmm. the state that we lost are kind of that we lost an awful lot rather than this being a kind of progression through um interesting yeah, mm -hmm. that's fascinating and and just like that the moment like the moment of coming into government then so so i can understand that you would have um you would have yeah I, I, I like this i can i can almost imagine obviously i can't completely but i can almost imagine like how finding that finding that tribe as it were and mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. and, yeah. but then coming into government for the first time because government or, or is or is government or is the culture was the culture fairly open like was it was it mm -hmm. difficult did you did we did you was that a moment of kind of stepping out of a comfort zone or or were you, have, you, have you had to sort of educate people as to 
who you are and how and and think and trans 101 kind of stuff or is that was that difficult or not really or have you just not really not really um i, I think uh, in in taiwan because there's so many coaches going on right just three languages in yeah. ethnic alone and and more than 20 if you count and that's not even counting english uh, really? which is not part of our uh you know national language but maybe in 10 years time but so basically uh because of this there there's a lot of uh um, I wouldn't say tolerance. There, there's a lot of fascination uh, about the kind of innovation that can happen if you uh, make a transcultural view, which is essentially looking at our own story, but from a story of a new culture that you approach only when you're an adult. So it's almost like a uh, reinterpretation of one's own life story, but from a different perspective that nevertheless share the same island, right? Uh, and so I think that's uh, what most people understand, especially people in the public sector that have been subjected to more than 12 years of gender mainstreaming work where each and every work that they do have to be assessed by independent uh, social sector members of the Gender Equality Council uh, to make sure that there's a dashboard that measures the gender equality of each and every um, uh, major bill and each and every major budget item that's more than 200 a year. Uh, and because of that, there's a real theory of change that's just keep pushing forward. And that's why we now have a parliament where there's more than 40% women, uh, which is really good by Asian standards, but okay by North uh, Nordic uh, standards. Uh, so that's uh, the the story of the change by the early feminists that made intersectional and that get, went all the way uh, to, for example, marriage equality and the other kinds of kind of transcultural uh, progressions. So I'm I'm caught between all those different things. And because yeah. my, my position is always a very meta position, like let's figure out a common value out of different positions. So I don't face any opposition. Lovely, thank you. And so, where what's the um, what's the edge of your learning at the moment? Like, what's hard? Mm -hmm. So, I, I like Taiwan, and, and is it is it going international? Is it the sort of Taiwan mm -hmm. health thing? Is it because obviously oh, yeah. the, the global context and the geopolitics are pretty threatening for you as as a country, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I mean, we're we're happy to to help and. Uh, not only sending masks overseas or mask plants, but also uh, holding physical uh, pride parades that uh, kind of <laughs> is quite rare this year in the world now. Uh, and, and all this is showing Taiwan to be a kind of regional, um, if not worldwide, uh, value setter. Uh, that if you hear from any of our other regional neighbors that in order to combat the coronavirus, you have to make sacrifice on human rights, or in order to combat disinformation, you have to make sacrifice on democracy uh, or whatever. And you can just point at Taiwan and, and say, you know, there's the Taiwan model. They uh, actually grow by GDP and by many other means uh, without uh, sacrificing human rights or democracy uh, while also taking care of the pandemic and the infodemic. Uh, and just as um, explanation of how we actually did it by trusting the citizens. I think uh, just make sure that people from Hong Kong to Thailand to any of our nearby jurisdictions currently making the societal conversation um, have a kind of real firm ground on which to not only anchor their narratives, but also a safe space that they can uh, work with international correspondents to tell their story. And do you think that's do you think that's going well? Like, obviously, I'm a long I'm a long way away, right? And in Britain, Taiwan, mm. I mean, I I I've titled the piece I wrote like the nation you're not allowed to learn from. Like, we never hear about. Yeah. It. Yes. Well, but but, but you, you you have bubble tea there, right? So sorry, you you do have bubble teas there. I hope. Uh, so is it uh, bubble okay. tea? Bubble tea. It's just a tea with some tapioca in it. Um, and like sushi, uh, which uh, speaks for Japan, uh, we usually joke about uh, if you have never heard of the Taiwan Semiconductor Company, if you have never heard of um, any of those Taiwanese contribution to the world, uh, you can go to your nearby friendly bubble tea place uh, yes. and then have a taste of Taiwan. It's open innovation, because as long as you put tapioca balls or really any chewy uh, stuff into any sort of tea, you can call it bubble tea, and it's a symbol of open innovation. Huh. Okay. Good. I've got that. Um, but it, but it feels like so. Uh, Jacinda Ardern has talked about the Taiwan model. Like, do you think 
help me understand. Do you think it's? Do you think it is gaining pace? Do you think? Do you think mm -hmm. more people are talking about Taiwan? You, mm -hmm. You've been locked out of the WHO. You've been like. Mm -hmm. How do you think that that sort of um, mm -hmm. that to be spoken about as a template is is going? I think WHO just recently praised the Taiwan model too. So okay. uh, yeah, they, 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 they did, uh, and especially around mask use. I think WHO really kind of come around uh, on that particular issue. Uh, and so I think it is a good thing, right? Uh, even though that we don't have ministerial access uh, through the WHO system for obvious reasons, uh, we do have some scientific access and uh, scientists that we, um, well, in Taiwan's case, it's the same because our top epidemiologists uh, happen to be our vice president. But in many other countries where it's not the case, uh, their scientists are telling their ministers that you really need to uh, learn from Taiwan and you really need to get into contact. So um, we, before the World Health Assembly this year, um, just a few days before, held a we held a 14 economies and countries, uh, kind of pre-WHA, WHA, where we share the Taiwan model. And there's just a nonstop of uh, conversation uh, ever afterward, just um, last week alone, I had maybe 10 different countries uh, calls talking about the Taiwan model. To, uh, like uh, two days ago, I was virtually uh, in the um, German uh, Bundestag uh, working with the many um, MPs uh, across many different parties, uh, all very eager to learn how we uh, did this digital quarantine without invading human right or over collecting any data we didn't collect uh, before the pandemic. That's a very specific question, but it, it goes on to show that people are interested in how the Taiwan model could be adapted to their jurisdiction, not just about this uh, kind of just very overall description of the Taiwan model uh, as a kind of inspiring spirit, which was kind of what I alluded to in my previous question before uh, Germany and, and other nations that are looking to uh, reducing the R value. Anything that can reduce R value a little bit is of tremendous use to them. Yeah. And sorry, one thing I'm, I'm meant to ask very, which I think is quite a quick point, but the, the, the way the, the, where the internet works, so you, you're able to do more, and I'm not a technologist, but you, you're able to do more kind of open source work than most countries. And that's an infrastructural point, right? Mm -hmm. Is there somewhere I can, you can point me to learn about that mm -hmm. a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Uh, there's, of course, the um, DG Plus plan. Uh, the broadband is human right uh, and things like that. Um, so I am happy to point you to uh, some like basic visions and frameworks. Uh, but if you need like specific um, answers to specific uh, policy choices, uh, then uh, we can talk more about those too. But uh, let me just pay to you a few like really broad overview uh, stuff uh, about digital opportunities and uh, the uh, innovation, collaboration, inspiration uh, part of the AI strategy. Cool. Thank you. I'll dig into that and I might ping you if there's mm -hmm. Specific. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, just uh, just so that you don't uh, mistake that we're all brochures. Uh, here is the civil IoT, which is uh, a little bit more on the details on how exactly it works to enable co-creation. Yeah. And and that's basically that. There's a there's a there's a slightly different infrastructure to what exists in the UK or Germany that, that, uh, at a at a base mm -hmm. at a sort of fundamental level. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I don't know about uh, the UK. But uh, in Germany, they are fascinated about this idea of broadband as a human right. Uh, like anywhere in Taiwan, even top of Taiwan, 4,000 meters, you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second. If you don't, it's my fault. It's that simple. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, requires a lot of auction design and spectrum uh, design and things like that to make sure that it really works. But it's just like the single payer universal health care when it comes to communication, health, and education. Uh, Taiwan is pretty socialist uh, as uh, uh, idea scale. It's on uh, everything else that we're a liberal democracy, but on these three metrics, we're a social democracy. Okay, cool. And so that that's a nice segue into um into like that last thing I'd love to chew a bit with you, which is the the the, the philosophy, like and and what you, so you've described yourself as a conservative anarchist, yeah, which is just Taoist uh, using Western labels, but yes, yeah, that's Taoist in Western labels, yeah. Can you say a bit more? So, I guess my um, I I sort of identify politically as a as a liberal, um, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. as a, and and my and and my the party I'm a member of is called the Liberal Democrats. It's um, oh, yeah. Um, so the lang- and to me, my, my sort of understanding of those terms is li- liberal means believe in people and believe that that people should, and democrats believe that people should have power. So it's like that's and, exactly right. Yes, and and so what? But you so so, and and to me, that's almost so anarchist suggest i mean I, and i and i've read i've read kropotkin i kind of i understand yeah, it, it, anarchy is just as simple as saying we give no orders and take no orders it's that simple and why conservative and well if you have lived with the amis people or the atayal people uh, you probably know what i mean by conservative because if you go to a referendum if you go through representative democracy it's very likely that's because of the liberal order uh, the liberal um, um, economy uh, that uh, their ways of life, their oral culture, not at all written culture, uh, will get invalidated uh, in the name of progress. Uh, and I'm a conservative in the sense that I want to conserve the cultures, especially the oral cultures uh, that are important to me uh, culturally, uh, and also part of the internet culture too, because internet is a kind of fundamentally anarchist experiment. Uh, and uh, at the core of internet is this permissionless innovation thing, uh, which can very easily actually uh, be disrupted if the um, governments think that it knows better, uh, uh, like for example, claiming sovereign over the internet or things like that and that's uh the internet culture is also something that i would like to conserve so conserve to me means just you know making sense of the traditions not disrupting the uh, traditions in the name of progress but rather uh, make a way so that the tradition still makes sense to future generations and and that's a kind of very long term uh, like seven generations uh point of view and i understand that's what the original term conservative uh means uh when it first uh uh, talks about monarchy uh, in in Western stand- standards because monarchy has been around for thousands of uh, years, but that's not the case uh, for uh, the indigenous um, nations. Although they have something resembling monarchy, I don't think they are monarchistic uh, in any given um, dif- definition of the modern uh, Westphalian state. So the thing that I conserve may not be the same thing that the uh, you know loyalists uh, conserve, but but it captures the image of a kind of running a conservancy like protecting was important across the ages. How, how do you see the relationship on the similarities and differences? Can you speak a bit more to the, to the, to the internet culture and the indigenous mm-hmm. culture? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, certainly. So uh, the internet culture and indigenous culture that I'm aware of in Taiwan, uh, both rely heavily on this idea of commons, of, um, um, I don't even know the British equivalent. Here we call it the social sector, right? People who uh, work with the commons, mainly reinvest into the commons uh, and co-govern the commons uh, with anyone who care about the commons. Uh, and, and that forms a sector in its own. Uh, and the public sector, which is the state, and the private sector, which is the businesses, are all well and good. But legitimacy-wise, the social sector is of a higher legitimacy than either the public or the private sector. And so that's the configuration uh, that what the internet's open multi-stakeholder model means uh, and also is what the indigenous um, kind of agenda setting process uh, means for the indigenous uh, culture to continue uh, through uh, the wisdom of the the elders transmitted uh, to the very young people instead of uh, just relying on um, code of um, law or code of agriculture. Uh, and so it's actually a very, very simple insight. It's mostly uh, just that people who care uh, have a say. And when people care enough uh, and can lead the way, uh, other people kind of learn by example and by osmosis instead of by hierarchies as in the state uh, bureaucracy or by purchasing power as in the free market. Um, so so that's the, the very basic, like uh, very high level overview of things of how the social sector is organized. And I think internet is one of the most pure social innovations out there that proves that there could be a social sector as a sector. Fascinating. It's, it's really so the, in the in the ideas I work with, we we talk about a shift uh, across the last hundred years uh, from from subject to consumer to citizen mm-hmm. as an idea yeah. of the individual in society. Yeah. 
and, and increasingly I've come to see it that, that actually it was citizen, subject consumer citizen, the, the sort of the, the grand historical narrative that it was that, it, that, that and, and, and so sort of, yeah, we began our sort of birthright as humanity as a citizens and then, and then, and then imposed. But the, um, or actually sort of the subject mentality almost. Mm -hmm. as, the, the um, one of the one of the um, things I'm fascinated by, I'm sure you know the work of Marshall McLuhan, the the, the, mm -hmm. the, the Canadian. So the, those phrases like the medium is the message, and and and, sure. and, then, and then first we shape our tools, and then they shape mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, and and don't hate the media, be the media. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah. it's that it's that sh to my mind the transition that we are making is is that consumer to citizen shift. It's mm -hmm. like. Or, or could make, and and the risk mm -hmm. is that the subject sort mm -hmm. of mentality re reforms. And I mean, mm -hmm. I, just listen. Sorry, I'm just thinking with you now. Mm -hmm. the, the 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 idea, the role of the web, so it, as a medium, is like. Mm -hmm. So we, we, television was a consumer medium. You could choose between mm -hmm. the channels, but but there were very few people behind mm -hmm. deciding what was on. The internet yeah. is a many to many medium, right? So, right. so the, the web is the the other way around. There's uh, many webmasters, but not many people uh, viewing. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and so this is essentially uh, people are by default producers. So in Taiwan, in the K-2 curriculum, we teach now media competence, uh, data competence, uh, digital competence. Uh, we did away with the term literacy because literacy to me suggests that people are consumers, right? Power, that's, that's a huge mind shift. Yes, I love that. Is there anything? I mean, I, I, I mean, I think I've got my uh, my questions answered, and then some. Is there anything I can do for you, or anything you're like your your one you you're working on, or anything like? I, I, it seems a, seems almost a sort of arrogant offer to make, but is there like if there is, then then let me know. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, our foreign service, um, like the, the person that uh, is in charge of our foreign service Twitter account, really like your medium posts. Uh, and uh, I will go on the record saying that if it's kind of less uh, critical of the UK and may actually cause uh, our foreign service trouble if we retweeted your message, we would like to retweet more of your message. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So I need to write. I need to write some things that are that are that are still still just as factual, but perhaps slightly less angry. Yes. Uh, and and then and then I'll work with our foreign service to get your uh, messages retweeted uh, by by the foreign service people. Yeah. Excellent. I will try and be a try and be a better ambassador, a more acceptable ambassador for Taiwan. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Amazing. Um, Audrey, I, it's been a real treat to spend some time with you and I hope we can do it again sometime, but I will, um, I'll keep you posted on where I get and, uh, and try and, as I say, try and be a more effective uh, ambassador. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, awesome. live awesome. long and prosper, as they say. Yeah, peace and long life. Uh, and send me the recording and oh, we'll make a transcript together. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, get a, I'll, I'll do both. I'll get a transcript made and I'll send mm -hmm. you both. Okay, bye.